Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, namaste, greetings of the day to everyone. On behalf of the Kodi International Institute, I welcome you to this very, very special talk. A special welcome to the men here. And we all know that this is not a men versus women issue. This is a people versus prejudice issue. This is a people versus profit issue, as we would put it now. So on the 10th anniversary of the International Center for Women's Leadership, I take a lot of pride and honor in welcoming one of my mentors and a beautiful human being, Sri Lata Bhatliwala. Zindabad, salam, namaste, shidi, as we call her fondly. A real hearty welcome to all of you. I'm sure a lot of you know her already, but for those who do not, Shridi, as we call her, a sister, a comrade that she is and has always been, is a feminist activist, scholar, and a trainer. Well, apart from being a grandmother, a mother, and a wonderful mentor, she is a currently the senior advisor of knowledge building with Kriya. She is also a senior associate gender at work, uh, which is a global network of gender experts, as we all know. Shridi is an honorary professor at SOAS, one of the most esteemed colleges in the University of London. Shridi's work focuses on building knowledge from practice, capacity building of young activists, and I know that because I have been one of them, activists and social organizations, which she still does, and, and you know her tirade towards the enhan enhancement of feminist justice is tireless. So uh, Shridi brings in four decades of grassroots activism, and we know her, the thousands of women that she has trained across India and the globe. She's also supported in movement building of marginalized women, which is, you know, when Alice Walker says that feminism, uh, about feminism and womanism and purple is to lavender, I think Shridi puts that into praxis. So she's worked with the most dispossessed women. And apart from that, you know, something that we've always read and heard about academics and activism being binary, she bridges that and she totally demystifies it. So she's done her researches, she's done her scholarly work, and it's graded very high in terms of the content and the knowledge that she has generated. She's still talking about one of the books that she's writing. She's also worked around grant making, grant making and policy advocacy. So that's a whole myriad range of issues which Sridhi specializes in. She's worked, of course, a lot in Karnataka in the southern part of India in Mumbai. She's worked with Ford Foundation, with Harvard and with Avid, which is something that we all have known. She has written and published extensively on gender issues, on feminist leadership, and you know the musings of feminist leaderships as we have today will come in very, very handy as we move forward in developing our own content and in our own uh, thought processes around this issue. So these make you stop and think about the deeper structures under quotes that Sridhila writes, the deeper patriarchal, capitalist, racist structures, that all of us face. So who can be better than Sridi in today's majlis, a gathering as we call it in, in India and in Urdu, of like-minded like spirits, all of us here, men, women, non-binary people. So please, please join me in welcoming Sridi. And in order to welcome her, I have somebody very special who again is an activist, has been an activist and a scholar, and a feminist leader, please, I, I would like to invite Eileen Alma, who heads the Center, International Center for Women's Leadership. So she joins me in welcoming Sridi. And before we move ahead and listen from Sridi herself, Eileen, please come over. Thank you so much, uh, Sarika, and welcome Sri Lanka to the Cody Institute and the International Center for Women's Leadership. And we're so delighted that you're here today. Um, we're delighted that everybody has joined us today. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us. And as uh, Sarika said, um, on behalf of the Cody Institute, we welcome you to this first in a series of webinars and events that are celebrating 
the 10th anniversary of Cody's International Center for Women's Leadership this year. Um, I'd first like to um, share with you that the Cody Institute, which is at St. Francis Xavier University in Canada, is located on Mi'kma'ki. This is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people who were here thousands of years prior to European settlers arriving on these lands that are now known as Canada. This territory, the Mi'kmaq territory, was covered, is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact, it recognizes the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and establishes the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. So each day um, here at Cody, we're very fortunate to be living on Mi'kma'ki, to be working on Mi'kma'ki, to be collaborating with the Indigenous communities and leaders, not just here, but across the entire country that's now known as Canada. And I urge you, no matter where you are in the world, to really reflect on the territory that you live in and acknowledge and honour those peoples who have always lived there and looked after those lands. Now, more than 10 years ago, the former director and vice president of Cody Institute at St. Francis Xavier University, um, Mary Coyle, and her colleagues and advisors had a vision for a center which would be specifically focused on supporting the goals and capacities of women leaders globally and in Canada, and in particular helping them as they advance in social, political, and economic arenas and help them to strengthen the potential for social change. And lead, so we know that meeting and responding effectively to challenges in this century depends on the commitment and the abilities of societies to achieve equality, especially for the world's women. We know that empowered women means empowered quality of life for everyone. And yet women continue to be underrepresented. underrepresented and while significance have been gained, there's also been lots of slides backward. So our work at the Cody Institute and in the Center for Women's Leadership is, is a, a modest, but it's a critical part of collective effort globally to advancing gender equality and advocating in particular for intersectional feminist leadership, strong partnerships that are women-led and like-minded, also in, in supporting the decolonization of development practice and really looking at citizen-led community-driven action, knowledge creation, and, uh, and change. So it's been my honor and my privilege to be the director of the center for the last eight years. And prior to that um, was Dr. Linda Jones, who was its inaugural director. 10 years later, here we are. Now, Mary Coyle, our former uh, leader and uh, VP and director has taken her own leadership journey. And now she's an esteemed Senator in our Canadian parliament and continues to be a trailblazer and a huge advocate for our work. The Cody Center for Women's Leadership has grown from a, key, a few key flagship programs now to a range of in-demand educational opportunities that have benefited more than 2,000 incredible women. And all of them are proud alumni in our network. For the last several years, the demand for our work hasn't subsided, but it's indeed grown with an average of 1,200 applications for our programs, not uncommon each year. None of this would be possible without our current faculty, uh, which includes Sarika, Robin, Veronica, Brianne, Carrie Lynn, Krista, and our program staff, Andrea, Eric, and Kate, who are all leading the way on innovative programs that respond to the priorities of our leaders all over. We're also so grateful for the broader Cody team and the support of the senior leadership and the many team members who um, were part of the center who have now since moved onward in their respective journeys, who shared their passion, knowledge, and commitment um, as part of the work that we do. I'd especially like to thank um, all of the funders and the supporters of, of the center, and in particular recognize the support and trust that we've had for one funder, one particular funder whose ongoing work sustains the core of our center and who chooses to remain in the background anonymous who's helped us be daring and innovative in our support for our participants and our graduates. So we welcome you to be part of this work together and don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, you can see our website at cody.cnfx.ca or you can contact us for more information at womenlead.cnfx.ca. 
So I can't um, think of a better way to talk about the kind of work that we do than to have this conversation today with Sri Lata and with Sarita. And both of them are such amazing scholars and activists in their own right, and so eloquently reflect the importance of our work. This is a first in a series of a thought of a year of thought provoking conversations with feminist leaders. Um, and we're excited that you're here with us today, and we look forward to this journey together with you. So over back to you, um, uh, Sarika and Sri Lata, I'm very excited for our conversation today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for the lovely intro and thank you for acknowledging everyone who's been a part of this team. So everyone, uh, today we're going to listen and talk and ask questions to Sriri. And uh, I think Sriri is one of those people who's been able to evolve the ideology, critical thinking, you know, in a milieu, in terms of her own personal experiences, and then the work that she has done with the most dispossessed people. So to use ideology as a measure of shifting status of women, it must be deeply entrenched against a careful analysis of social structure, economic conditions and institutional change. And that when she will explain is absolutely mind blowing. So I'm not going to stand between I would request Sridi to start from her own journey and use that in terms of theorization. And, and we know that you know feminist leadership appears to be an oxymoron because we've all known of the glass ceiling that exists. We've all known of how when you want something done, you ask the woman, but when you want to hear something, you ask the man. But how is it that you evolved as a person? And how and, and, and what are the challenges that you face? And how did you come to Take that in your stride is something that we would really want to hear from you. So over to you, Sridi. Thank you so much, uh, Sarika and Eileen. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be participating today as part of this 10th anniversary celebration of the Cody Institute. Um, I have great respect for the Institute and the work that it has done. Uh, so let me begin by saying namaste, salam alaikum, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hola, wherever you are located, uh, Karibu. I hope uh, this uh, conversation uh, where I share some of my journey and the learnings, uh, the lessons I've learned from my journey uh, about leadership will be just a starting point of an ongoing series of conversations where we can link between uh, experience and concepts and theory and practice over and over again, because that's the best way to build uh, real insight and real wisdom. Um, so I have just um, a few uh, slides that I'm going to um, uh, start by sharing and just to sort of open up the conversation and to introduce you uh, to just a few insights that I've distilled. Some of these insights underlie some of the theorization that I've done. So those of you who have read some of my stuff or are familiar with some of my frameworks will, will see the linkages and otherwise we can try and draw them out in our conversation. So this is, I've titled it Exploring Feminist Leadership, My Journey and the Lessons from My Journey. So here's the journey uh, piece itself, the first 20 years, which was really the period of direct hands-on grassroots work. First in a community health project, in a health context, training and supporting women to become community health workers, but at the same time studying national health policy, community health issues, and kind of trying to gender uh, the entire perspective on health and health policy. I then moved on to uh, join together with a band of comrades and sisters to create an organization called SPARC. 
And we decided to begin mobilizing, organizing, and building a movement of women living in the pavement slums of Bombay. This is very important. The women who lived in these pavement dwellings, which is along the sidewalks of the cities, were the most marginalized of the urban poor, even more marginalized and excluded and oppressed than those who lived in the more organized slums, which at least had some political protection because slums were big vote banks in those days. And we decided to move away from the then common widespread approach of going into communities and offering something, offering services of some kind, health services, you know, education, nutrition programs, income generation, you know, the kind of stuff I mean, and to really apply the popular education methodology, the feminist popular education methodology, um, which, you know, uh, Freire and his uh, cohort first innovated in, in Brazil. And this was also my first experience of being in a sort of formal uh, leadership role as a sort of co-director uh, of this organization of Spark. I then moved from working with urban uh, poor women to uh, my back to my home state of Karnataka in South India and set up a very interesting program, which was actually launched by the government of India, a women's empowerment program, imagine, launched by the government, where we were asked to, and you know, that was the mandate of the organization or the woman date of the organization, to mobilize, organize, and build a movement of the most socially and economically marginalized and excluded and stigmatized rural women, Dalit and indigenous women, also uh, women who were Devadasis. This is the sort of ritualized traditional uh, system of uh, certain Dalit communities having to dedicate their daughters to a sex work under the guise of dedicating them to a temple, uh, the Devadasi system. So including women who had been ritually and uh, in a customary system of, of sex work. And then of course, who were largely trafficked to the um, red light areas of the big cities. And here again, using the same feminist popular education methodology, but in the rural context. And here for the first time in my life, and I have to say rather reluctantly, being in the formal leadership role of the director of this organization, which was this kind of semi-government structure, very traditional, you know, lovely hierarchy as it were. But what I want to do now is to just uh, talk about uh, some of the, um, sorry, some of the uh, highlights of my, of my learning uh, during this period, this first 20 years, the, what were the highlights? Uh, one was of course, practicing feminist popular education, figuring out what, what it is, how to do it in these communities who initially were like, well, if you're not gonna give us anything, why should we waste our time talking to you? And you know, getting past those sort of initial challenges and resistance. And then as the mobilization process started working and women started coming together in collectives, really working hard to build new models of collective leadership and shared decision-making. And not only with the community women, but even in our own organization, creating the shared leadership model in the organization, sharing, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, rights of representation, for instance, with government officials or with donors or whatever, really looking at how we ourselves were sharing power in, in our own uh, structure. Um, really experimenting with developing and using very creative communications and mobilization tools, using theater, using art, using music, building on traditional proverbs, traditional songs, for instance, 
imagery uh, drawn from uh, the women's own cultures. And all during this process, insisting, and that was me, insisting that we had to analyze as we acted. That, you know, activism without analysis is very dangerous because you get so intoxicated with action at that you're not really often thinking about, wait a second, what impact is this having? Who's getting excluded? That was a constant question that I would bring to the table. And how do we now move to the next level of action if we don't analyze, yeah? And another thing that I feel very proud of uh, uh, having been part of and having pushed forward is to debunk this idea that activists can't do research, that activism excludes any kind of data generation, documentation, research throughout this process. Like for example, in Spark, we were the ones who did the first census of pavement dwellers in Bombay city, not the municipal corporation of Bombay, not the government of the state or the government of India, but we, a small band of sisters with our community women, we managed to conduct the first census of 32,000 households living on the pavements uh, of uh, South Bombay. So, and then using this data to inform the advocacy and the movement building strategies, because suddenly the data was not something that was extracted and taken and used by somebody else to frame policies about you and for you, but the data is yours. It's your data, which you use to press, to first of all, understand the issues your own issues from a new perspective, but also to press forward for things that have meaning to you, have your own advocacy priorities. And finally, as part of that process, I also feel proud of having co-created very bottom-up, very feminist ways of monitoring and evaluating our impact, our work, our progress. Uh, and the lovely example I wanted to share with you is um, when we ask the women, uh, how will you explain your empowerment to somebody who comes from outside and says, what is all this empowerment? What change has it made in your lives? You're not earning a rupee more. You're not getting water at your doorstep. You're not you know, getting better health care. So what is this empowerment? And she said, I'll tell you, one of the women said, I'll tell you how I measure it. Before I became part of this collective, I would look at the landlord's feet and speak to him. Today, I'm looking at the button on his shirt. Tomorrow, I'll look him straight in the eyes and speak to him. That's how I measure my empowerment, yeah? So we really began to create these very new sort of indicators and very sort of textured, powerful measures uh, of change. Then I moved out of direct grassroots activism, supporting it, supporting those doing it, ceding the leadership of it to um, uh, new women. I'm not saying necessarily younger because I was very young then myself but ceding it to new women, opening the space for new people to, to come in. And so in the second 25 years up till now, these are some of the things that I did. Grant making at the Ford Foundation, as Sarika mentioned. And there, before here again, I want to tell you a story. Before I went to the Ford Foundation, one of the, th the um, pavement women in Bombay had a farewell party for me. And at the farewell party, uh, one of them, who's a very powerful woman, Madina, she made a speech and she said, look here, we taught you everything you know about how to organize women. Thanks to us, you lot. Then you went to the South, you went to Karnataka and you organized those village women and you did a good job. So we were proud of you. Now we are sending you to the, this big organization in America. And 
just remember one thing don't get a big head because we will be sitting like ghosts on your shoulder and asking you every day what have you done to support the movements of poor women so when i was at ford the first thing I did was to overhaul the whole global civil society portfolio and start funding and pushing resources to grassroots movements that were struggling to go global and that were trying to sort of speak for themselves and find a voice and space of their own at the global level. Then I moved to uh, the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations at Harvard University as a practitioner fellow, where I did a lot of research and teaching about transnational civil society and social movements, and really dismantling the stereotype that both students and faculty had that global civil society uh, doesn't mean grassroots movements, that there's some sort of a contradiction between saying grassroots and global as though grassroots people cannot be global actors and global forces. I then moved on to work, I moved back to India and moved on to work with AVID as a scholar associate. And here what I was experimenting with very consciously was how do I model the capacity of an older feminist uh, to work under young feminist leadership. I wanted to model that. I wanted to experience it, but also model it. And so Avid, my direct boss, whom I reported to Cindy Clark, who's now the, one of the co-directors of Avid, she was younger than my daughter, who's my second child. And the head of the organization, Lydia Alpazar, uh, very beloved to me, a great leader. I'm so proud of having worked under her leadership and her vision, she was uh, two years younger than my older child, my son. So this was a real leap in terms of placing myself in a very different location. And finally, uh, for the last many years, I've been working with Kriya as a senior advisor, again, under younger women's uh, formal leadership, and also supporting gender at work as a senior associate. So what did have been the highlights of this last 25 years? One I already mentioned, grants that really supported grassroots networks and movements to become global actors, writing and building theory from practice, the thing I pride myself on. And the thing that probably I'm most proud of is that with Kriya since 2008, uh, I really developed a new pedagogy and a new approach to training young feminist activists, uh, which includes men, by the way, men, um, uh, trans women, and non-binary people as well, and have innovated a pedagogy that really moved away from this very utilitarian approach in training, typical of, let's teach them how to, how to organize, how to mobilize, how to fundraise, how to manage your organization, how to write a proposal, et cetera. I was like, no, I wanted the focus of the training to be on why are we doing this and what are we trying to change? So it was an entirely different pedagogy, lots of concepts, pushing activists to engage with theory and continually linking that um, with practice. This has proved to be an extremely successful model, this, this pedagogy, because I still meet people who attended a course 10 years ago and say, it changed my life, it's changed my activism forever. I'm always now asking the question, why and what am I trying to change, yeah? Um, declining formal leadership positions. I was headhunted for a lot of big jobs, but I don't want to talk about that because it sounds like boasting. But I really just decided, no, I don't want to do that stuff of being, you know, director of this and CEO of that, and really modeling serving under younger leaders. And of course, I think during this time, I was really able to help advance feminist thinking and activism through the trainings 
on empowerment, power, patriarchy, movement building, feminist leadership, feminist mentoring is my latest um, sort of collaborative project and building a theory and practice of feminist mentoring. And we're going to launch the feminist mentoring guide next week in the CREA uh, website. So what lessons have I learned? Uh, I think I'm a little behind time. Let me try and rush this a bit. Uh, what are the lessons I learned? So here are the insights I got about myself through this journey. I realized I like being a deputy. I like being a lieutenant. I never really aspired to being the boss. Huh? I was a reluctant leader at best. But the fact is that I now realize I was always leading from every location uh, because of my passion, because of whatever you know skills or capacities I brought to the table. In some manner, I was leading. It didn't matter whether I was sitting in the director's chair or not. The most powerful lesson I've learned in this last 45 years, and I'm sharing this with all of you with great passion and great belief and, and, and great uh, joy, is that the more I shared power, the more powerful I became. The act of sharing power is very empowering. It's even intoxicating. And I don't just mean formal positional power, but also that power within, the power of your ideas, the power of whatever experience and insights you have, the power of your love of solidarity, of your belief in others, your knowledge, uh, the stories you have to share. So it's sharing both formal power in that sense, but also the power to make decisions, the power to have a voice. This is the more you give it away, the more powerful you become. And I just don't understand why people are so scared to cede power, to give up power, because inside they feel they will shrivel, they will be diminished. Actually, you will grow. You will grow powerful in a new way. And I also realized that I was among a very rare breed of people who actually enjoy straddling the worlds of theory and practice, research and advocacy, activism and training, I really thrive on leading from the back. That was my inner power. So the lessons I've learned about leadership, uh, my own and others, is first of all, I learned to recognize my own class, caste, and all kinds of other forms of social power and privilege that initially I just didn't look at. But I also learned to recognize my strengths. And both these recognitions really came to, came to me thanks to the insights that uh, many of the women I worked with shared. I have lovely stories to share about that, but I won't go into them right now uh, because it will take a lot of time. Um, when I became a grandmother, I think it really helped me gain a new perspective on power and leadership because I discovered the joy of leading from the back, of supporting others. But the challenge was also to learn to stand back and let someone else do it differently from the way you think it should be done or that the way you did it. So you have to actually learn new ways of doing things, whether this was with my first baby granddaughter or whether it was, you know, standing by and watching someone else take over a process that I had helped build and take it in some different direction. Because the fact is I had taken processes in different directions from my predecessors, but it takes a lot of struggle, inner struggle and pain and humility to learn to do that. I believe I have become far more powerful today, more of a leader in some ways than I ever was when I held a formal leadership position. And I think that's because of the things I have done 
because I didn't get into that formal leadership uh, pathway, you know, the climbing up the ranks so that eventually I have to be head of, I don't know, Amnesty International or Action Aid or Oxfam or whatever. I had opportunities to go there and I didn't. And I think because of that, in some ways, my voice, my writing, the training, I feel I'm more powerful and in a, some sense more of a leader, if you like, a thought leader. So I think the key insight I wanted to share with you is that, uh, and I discovered this actually when I was at Harvard and they were having these, uh, they had these sort of job uh, training, you know, workshops for women students. Uh, and they would come and talk to us. And I was on this panel where they would come and talk to us about their, their job goals and their work goals and so on. And they would say, so how did you plan your career? And I realized with a start that I never planned my career. If somebody had told me in 1975, when I started working, that uh, in 19... Uh, in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, you will be in Harvard, you know, teaching postgraduates. I would have said, don't be silly. That's stupid. Where am I ever going to go there? So I realized that day and that I worked a lot in exploring that insight is that I committed to a cause, not a career and not to becoming a leader. And the cause I committed to was the empowerment of the most excluded people, supporting them to build movements and supporting other young feminists to do it. And I've tried to serve this cause from all these different locations and different organizations and roles, from grassroots activism, from research institution, from a grant making organization, from the academy, global feminist organizations, and being a grandmother uh, in the feminist movement. So these are all the locations from which this cause is what I've tried to serve and what I still try to serve. There are also lessons I've learned from and for others. That looking within and understanding your own history and relationship with power is absolutely critical to practicing power in a feminist way. That is, in other words, to being a feminist leader. The women I worked with gave me startling insights, as I told you, into my own power and my innate power. But also, it would be fun for you to try out my personal history with power exercise, which gives you some questions to explore, to look at your own history and relationship with power, which is something we don't interrogate or think about. Another profound insight I gained is that we try to change the world, but don't understand that we are sites of change as well. That that change we're trying to make in the larger world has to start from within us. And I think this is what has led to huge abuses of power within the world of feminist and social justice organization. And we're still doing so badly in this respect, as you know. I think I also discovered that feminists in some ways have greater struggles with power and leadership than others because their relationship with power is very uncomfortable. They want to dismantle power structures outside. They don't want to look at the power structures within that we've internalized the power structures we are recreating. So they said, no, we're gonna have these flat organizations, no formal leadership. Yes, but there were all these hidden, hidden sites of power within those so-called flat structures. And the whole power under syndrome, which I've written about and, and talked about, uh, we can come to later in, uh, if there's time. And all sorts of these hidden hierarchies, I don't have to name them, yeah? So I think we have a real struggle and one that we need to sort of tackle more honestly. So I'm gonna sort of wind down now by talking a bit about the myths about leadership that I need to think need to be dismantled. 
I may not have time to go into each of them in, in much detail, but here they are. First myth is because I lead a feminist organization, I'm a feminist leader. Because I lead a social justice organization, I'm a socially just leader. Sorry, not at all true. Why, if this is the case, then are feminist and social justice organization so full of toxic practices, abuses of power and horrible power dynamics. So being a feminist leader, being a social justice leader means I have to first confront myself. I have to make visible and transform my own internalized practices of power as well as the dynamics, the hidden dynamics of power in our organizations, which are called deep structures. This means that we really have to create very conscious and sustained mechanisms of interrogation and accountability for ourselves and within our organizations. And most are too afraid to do that. But there are toolkits, there are resources, there is expertise available. Feminist mentors can play a very big role in this process as I discovered over the last two years. The second myth is that leading social change means changing them, not us. So I've already talked about this, that no change begins with us. We are a site of change. We have to start practicing power differently. We have to model that change that we're saying is possible outside. The third myth is that leadership is about power, authority, or control. In my view, this is the lowest form of leadership. It is patriarchal, and it's based on the binary, leaders, followers, subordinates, and we unconsciously reproduce these when we gain positions of power because we are afraid otherwise that will people know that I'm the leader? Will people take me seriously? Will they listen to me? No, I have to show that I'm the boss. So this really arises because every model of leadership we've seen from our earliest childhood, families, communities, are all of this patriarchal, hierarchical style of, of leadership. The fourth myth is that leadership can only be practiced from positions of formal power. We know that's not true. It can be practiced from anywhere, as I told you, was my experience. But here I do want to share a quote from my beloved friend and fellow feminist trainer from Zimbabwe, Hope Chikudu, because Hope says, look, leadership is not about positional power. It's about creating a domain, a space, in which human beings continually deepen their understanding of reality and become more capable of changing that reality, of creating new reality. So it's not about being in a formal position of power. You can lead with your ideas, your passion, your creativity from wherever you're located, as I discovered. The fifth myth, very widespread, I'm powerless, how can I lead? But we know that feminist leadership is based on this very simple truth that no one is ever completely powerless. We all have this power within, but our connection to it is often broken. And if we are able to reconnect with it, then it you know, unleashes uh, enormous kinds of capabilities within us. The thing is interesting about inner power though, is that it is never manifested in my experience as of you know domination and aggression no this inner power the leadership that comes from inner power is really very liberating it's it's kind of a radiant force of change uh, greater i believe than any dictator army or or weapon uh, and finally, the sixth myth is that leadership requires age and experience. Some of the best leaders I've worked with were both young in age and never held leadership positions before. Uh, they were getting access to the capacity to lead in because of these new spaces that we created. I personally did some of the most pathbreaking work leadership work in movement building organizations in my 20s and 30s. And I don't remember, frankly, anybody calling me at that time a young leader or a young feminist leader. I was, I was a feminist activist, that's what I was called. And oh, you know, Srilata's doing a good job in that rural women's movement building. 
Some of the worst leaders I've observed have both age and experience, and it doesn't seem to have helped much. And here I have to tell you the donkey story. The donkey story also comes from one of the rural uh, women's collective leaders, who she said, see, don't tell me how much experience you have, how long you've been doing X, Y, Z. So has the donkey. The donkey also has 30 years experience carrying that load every single day. What have you made of your experience? That is what is important. Otherwise, you're still a donkey. Okay. So age and experience don't mean much, we know, when it comes to leading these deep transformative processes. So look at Black Lives Matter. Look at the uprisings in Hong Kong and Myanmar, very young, 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 young people. Look at Frida, look at Greta Thunberg, her capacity to mobilize millions of high school kids around the world, around this is our future that you guys are uh, destroying. So I think this, is, this myth is really patriarchal ageism thinly disguised. Um, I've really learned these lessons about feminism and social justice activism, but I'm not, I don't think I'm going to go through them. I think the thing that I just do want to share is that academic theories about power, politics, movements, et cetera, I read a lot of that stuff, especially when I was at Harvard, they really need to be challenged and their feet has to be held to the fire of grounded experience. But on the other side, Activist self-righteousness, I'm out there doing the real work, you know, activist rejection of theory and uncritical, unthinking activism is, as I said, highly dangerous and must also be challenged because it's like the donkey, you know, you're just doing the same thing over and over again and you're not really looking critically at where have you headed in the process. So I think activists also need really to engage with concepts and theory. That's what I tried to do in the Kriya Institutes. And it really you know, was fantastic to see the chemistry that emerged. They need to think and act more analytically and strategically, and they need to access concepts and analytical tools. But these have to be provided in non-academic forms. You know? Academic discourse is designed to exclude to mystify and basically to make you realize how dumb and ignorant you are. That's how academic discourse is constructed. Yeah, it's a highly exclusionary. So I see my job as bringing that stuff out here and explaining it to you the way I would explain it to women living in the pavement slums, the theory of Marx's theory of extraction of surplus value. And when I explain it, they were like, oh, we've known this all along. So that's why I started writing this all about series of primers for activists, all about power, all about movements. Watch this space for, I don't know what comes next in all about. And I've also seen that the theory and concepts that we build from activism are the most powerful of all. A lot of this work is being used in the academy and is valued in the academy, even though it was created by us, by activists. So I just want to conclude by saying that in a way, the most important lesson of all that I've learned is that new generations of feminist activists are reinventing everything. They're reinventing leadership, they're reinventing organizing, uh, they're reinventing movement building, and there is lots to learn. So I'm still in a process of learning. Thank you. Wow. Sorry, that took much longer than it should have. I'm really no, it, it could have taken longer. Please don't be, not at all. These are very, very deep musings. And I see lots of questions popping in already. I think the fact that we talk about personal is political. I think you explained that so well, you know, whether it's, it's the feminist popular education and taking that to Howard or to SOAS or changing ourselves before we change others. You know, I, I think that was like really well explained. I also feel that, you know, your musings around feminism are really very deep, Sridhi. 
So while we are aware of our discrimination, very few of us acknowledge the kind of privileges that we have. And we mm -hmm. do have a lot of privileges, right? So I think, I think it's, that, that was beautiful. I also think that it's okay to be a reluctant leader rather than a benevolent autocrat. Which is the most <laughs> well put, well said. <laughs> so you know, I, I I could just go on, but uh, I think I'm going to start with the questions because plenty of questions have come in, and I'm also requesting people to ask their own questions. So I know you chat typed them in the chat box, but we also want to hear from you. So I want to begin with Muhammad Mapalala. If you could please unmute yourself and ask your question. He's I don't I don't know that they have access to the webinar setup. Oh, we Maybe don't. Jenny or Brian, you can say. From what I can see, Eileen, there's no uh, microphone access for attendees. Right. Right. So so I'll I'll pick up Mohammed Mapalala's question first. And thank you for asking this. So he says, what is the practical difference? between feminist and gender activist? That's his first question. And the second one is why many of us think that feminist movement is only for women. So, okay, I think, do you want me to answer each or shall we take a few? I was going to pick up a couple of other questions and then maybe club them together. I think okay, a lot just of repeat for me the second part of Mohammed's question. One is um, what's the practical difference between feminist and gender activists? And, and the, the second, second part one, was? Why do we think that feminist uh, movement is only for women? Right? Then uh, I'll just read them with the names. So there is Ayirula Salam. I am apologies if I didn't get your name right. She asks, how do you balance your work and family? And why I ask you this question is because for most women, this is an issue. So she's around the work-life balance. Then there is Alison Mati, who asks about, I'm interested to know what the young leaders you worked under, under in quotes, learned from you modeling being the deputy. So she wants to learn a little bit more about that. There is a Skoro Maminta who, who thanks you for the great presentation and the generosity in sharing your own wonderful insights. Uh, also asks about what was your turning point in your journey? What drove or motivated you to move towards feminist leadership, activism, or the cause itself? Then there is a question from Lauren, and I think this will be the last one, and then we'll open it again after hearing from you. I think I'm missing one by Mamata Raghuveer Jenny, if you could please put it again. Um, so Lauren asks, my question is about monitoring and evaluation insights you mentioned early in your presentation. What would you say are the best practices you found for a really meaningful MME that supports the work rather than taking away from it? And the last one is from Mamta Raghuveer. Why still women are more worried about what people think about her rather than realize her strengths and move ahead? Can we, how can we make women realize their inner power? That's quite a bit of a range of questions that you've got, Sridhi. Mm. So- Okay, okay, let's- uh... Let's tackle these first. Um, I'll try not to uh, go into length. Um, okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch some of the names, but okay, Mohammed's question was around, what is the practical difference between feminist and gender activist? I have a very simple answer. I don't know what on earth the gender activist is uh, because uh, gender is a power structure created by patriarchy, it's a power structure we are trying to dismantle. 
So if someone calls themselves a gender activist, I would have to conclude that they are trying to construct gender and keep it in place. Huh? So it's one of those nonsensical terms that has been coined in the development sector and you know, in the UN sort of spaces because they don't want to use the word feminist. They're so afraid, you know, it's like a stigma. It's like uh, waving a red flag. So I don't want to say feminist uh, and I don't want to say women's rights and stuff like that. So let me say gender because that sounds safe and it's unthreatening, okay? But it's a nonsense term because if I say I'm an activist, gender activist, it means I'm an activist trying to consolidate and protect the gender structure, which is one of the most fundamental discriminatory power structures in the universe, okay? Uh, all right, so that's a simple one. A feminist activist is someone who is trying to dismantle that power structure and the other power structures through which it operates and the other power structures which keep it in place, right? So we take an intersectional feminist approach to look at how patriarchy doesn't operate alone, it operates with capitalism, it operates with heteronormativity, it operates with, um, you know, uh, environmental destruction, it operates with and through everything, with the economic structures around us, uh, it operates through culture, blah, 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 yeah? Uh, I don't know why people think feminist movement is only for women. I'll give you my short answer on it because there's no time. But the way I answer this is to say uh, that, see, one is we have to understand this first from a historical political perspective. Yeah, that women needed to be in the lead of this movement. Otherwise, this movement would have also gotten taken over by men. And now you see worldwide very strong activism of men and boys for gender equality, men and boys against, you know, gender-based violence, etc. And, you know, groups like the Men Engage Alliance who are very sincerely uh, claim the title of feminist, they call themselves feminists, and they are trying to advance a feminist agenda, but they're trying to do it respectfully without taking away the spaces uh, where women need to lead or where, uh, you know, feminists need to frame the agenda, etc. So the reason people believe this is, I think, just simply historical, that historically, uh, the majority of feminists were women, where self-proclaimed feminists were women. And the assumption that women are the only ones who have something to gain from feminism, which is also a false notion, right? Because and I think because perhaps feminism hasn't wanted to spend much time, though now I think this is what the men's alliances for uh, gender equality are doing, is also try to emphasize what are the gains for men when you dismantle patriarchy, yeah? So the way I answer it is also to say, if a man can't be a feminist, then a woman can't be a socialist, right? Uh, it's ridiculous. I don't need a sexual organs uh, or a vagina or a, a, a penis or a uterus to practice an ideology. Feminism is an ideology. It's a social change strategy. It's a set of analytical tools. It can be used by people with all kinds of different uh, bodies and uh, sexualities and minds, yeah, if you embrace it. So I think this is the historical reason. Uh, I'll go next to um, the best practices for m and I want to go from some of the bigger questions to the personal ones, okay? Best practices for meaningful m and &E. I have found, uh, Lauren, that the most breakthrough insights I got was when we uh, bring down this barrier that says that uh, the people uh, who are the primary subjects of the change should not have a role in framing how we measure that change. That then it's subjective and not objective. Yeah. 
But when you break through that barrier, which again has been created by a patriarchal academy, um, you know, which is another one of those binaries they love, subjective, objective, you know, uh, professional, amateur, all this kind of stuff. I think when we are able to involve people, as I gave that example of how do I measure, how are you, how do you want to measure your empowerment? Well, her measure was actually extremely on target because where you look at the, your oppressor, the person who has power over you, is actually a measure of your status and your power vis-a-vis -vis that person. Similarly, women have given me in amazing insights when we were trying to do a study about um, uh, women's control over assets, private assets. It was a larger study on the status of women in rural uh, areas, but we were trying to ask a question. One of the parameters we were using is control over private assets. And we said, how do we get that? Not the sort of formal uh, control in the sense of ownership, for instance, of land or uh, cattle or uh, the house or whatever, but the real ownership. And the women said, oh, that's very simple. Just ask, what can you sell without asking anybody's permission when there is a crisis? That's the only asset you control. You just see what a powerful research question that turned into, because guess what? The men said they would first sell women's jewelry. So they believe that they control that asset and women said, we'll sell our jewelry, we'll sell our pots and pans, we'll sell our poultry. The men said exactly the same. The men did not say land. They did not say house. They said, no, that we can't sell without asking the elders and that sort of thing. So I'm just giving an example of how you get meaningful m &E when you break through some of these barriers and you really, same thing with the pavement dwellers when we were doing the census, we didn't sit down and decide what questions to ask. We sat with them and said, what should we be telling the city about you? The city says you're riffraff, you're criminals, you're thieves living on the pavement. How do we change? You know, you're, you're blocking up the transport system, you're dirtying the streets, et cetera. So they framed the questions. They said, here's what we want to tell the city about the role we play in the city's life and its economy. We don't even enter the transport system. We are living near our places of work, you know, things like that. So that would be my answer. I think those are the best practices among the best practices for meaningful m &E. And then I think it's the job of people like us, the intermediaries, to learn how to sell these measures. I'm using the word sell, you know, but how do we convince uh, people who we take this data to that this is valid data? Yeah, so we've actually done in, in Spark, we've done these challenge censuses uh, where the government debunked the data generated by the slum dwellers about say number of water points, toilets. We said, okay, we, we challenge you to do a counter census with us and we'll see whose data is accurate. Uh, I wanna come to th uh, now some of the personal questions like how do you balance your work and family? Uh, it was very, very tough. But uh, I think I can only, I, and I just don't believe there are any prescriptions for this. So I want to start by saying that. There are no formulas, right recipes. Here's the way to do it. Each of us has to work out for ourselves what matters when in our lives, okay? So please look in your heart and find the way that works for you, okay? Because no one else is you and no one else is living your reality. No one else is living with your pain, your challenges, the accusations thrown at you. You're such a bad mother, you're so negligent, etc. You're the one living with all that, right? So one thing I found was, uh, and now this is with the wisdom of hindsight, is when my children were little, they were always priority number one. Even when I was mobilizing the pavement dwellers, even when I was, you know, doing the work with the health organization, kid, the kids were priority number one. 
as they grew older, my work caught a greater share of priority. And finally, when they were young adults, they would tell me, no, mama, I'm fine. Don't worry about my fever. You please go. You have that important meeting today or don't keep the women waiting. Because they knew how important they were to me. So that's what worked for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there were struggles with my husband also, obviously. You know, you have to negotiate that relationship as well in terms of their expectations of you as a parent and uh, external, you know, extended family expectations. Those were easier to deal with because I could be defiant with the extended family. But this negotiation with your partner, with your children, etc., each of us has to work that out. And there's all I can tell you is that if either one suffers at the hands of the other, there is a price that we pay. That's the sad reality of, of being women. Yeah. What did the young leaders I worked with learn from you? I don't know. You'll have to ask them. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you a couple of things that I think they learned. One is I think they learned that that's a possibility for when they get older and they move out of those formal leadership roles, that it's okay that there are ways of being valued. They valued me, they respected me, they gave me so much affection and respect. They never treated me like, oh, you're my subordinate now, you know? They were very kind, very respectful because they respected what I was trying to do, you know? So I think hopefully they learned that this is a way of being as an older feminist as you, uh, age to move into a different location and that it's fine you can serve under younger people it's not some loss of face so hopefully that's one thing they they learned from me I think the other thing they learned from me is how incredibly productive you can be when you're not in a leadership role <laughs> you know there's so many things you can do when you're liberated from worrying about fundraising and management and accounts and performance assessments and all those things that you have to do that yeah there's a lot of joy in those other roles uh, what was the turning point in my journey in uh, for the cause itself I think the first turning point was my grandmother who was a very very uh, what they call an indigenous feminist a latent feminist uh, well before her time uh, who was deeply oppressed in her marriage, in her marital home, and who raised me till I was five. I was brought up by her, not by my parents. And she is the one who I think first incited me to question, to challenge, to claim my own voice, and who also incited me to grow up and do something for women. So that was first, the first trigger. And then in college, I was very fortunate to have a professor. I actually did English literature and my, my bachelor's degree was in English literature. And he introduced me. He saw my, you know, uh, sort of latent feminist uh, kind of questioning. And he ensured that I read all the early feminist authors. And that was it. By the time I finished reading, you know, uh, right from Savitri Bai Pule, one of our uh, own Indian, uh, you know, feminists, uh, to he introduced me to the poet saint Takama Devi, a feminist of the 13th century in Karnataka. Then he introduced me to, you know, Betty Friedan and Jermaine Greer and uh, of course, Simone de Beauvoir and Shulamit Firestone. And so that was it. That was it. I never looked back after that. Uh, why do people still worry about what people think about her and how to realize her in a past? I'm going to answer this in a very different way. I think it's because women don't have access to any other kind of space 
where people can think about her differently, where people will uh, view her in a non-judgmental way. Women don't have access to those spaces. When they get that access, this is what I saw in the grassroots work. When the women's collectives, the sangs, the samus, as we call them, formed, that became an alternate space where they felt valued. They didn't feel judged. They felt they could be who they were. Uh, when things were bad, when they were in pain, when they were being tormented at home, when they were being beaten, there was a support system that was created. So I think if women don't have access to that, they are going to worry about what people think about them in the spaces that they do occupy. Because there's no other space with any other system of, uh, of comradeship, do you see? So it's in these spaces, how do we give women access to these kinds of spaces? I think that's the question. So even as activists, you know, in your family, in your community, in your extended family, you may be very harshly judged and, you know, people may be talking all sorts of nonsense about, you know, she's roaming around, she's coming late at night, God knows what all she's up to, claiming that she's doing some social work and, you know, that sort of thing. So I think we have to really look at, are we creating enough solidarity spaces of a different kind, even virtually, even online? so that women have another space that makes them feel affirmed and valued for who they are. I'll stop. I could listen to you forever. No, please. Yes. I'm sure people are getting tired <laughs> of my voice. I can read the, the comments and I wish you could because you, you're too busy telling us uh, and giving your responses. But, you know, I, I sort of want to come back to negotiating space, which was a mantra, I think, and a very important one, which you mentioned, right, from personal to political. And, uh, you know, my heart goes back to Rosa Luxemburg and everything that she talks about social democracy. And I know for people who do not know, Mahila Samakya, which was a government-run program, and the way she negotiated space within that, you know, uh, mm. using using the government structures, both as poison as in medicine, but drawing that line, you know, having known how heartless some of these structures can be. I think that, that you know, uh, I, I would really want to hear a little more on that. But let me now move to five questions that we already have. So there is an anonymous attendee uh, who says, through your feminism, advocacy and activism, how has that contributed to the change in caste system? Physically, policy change, which is responsible for the marginalization of both women and men in India. That's the first one. Then there is Olivia who asks, I work on children's, uh, children's rights and wonder if you have had experience of children's movements or organization, notably in Bangalore, and if yes, could you share thinking on similarities, differences, or opportunities between fe feminist activism and child-led activism? The third one is by Muhammad Mapalala again. In Africa, most of the feminists are divorcing or don't get married. Are there any teachings that break marriage? I can tell you that they are not, but... But you know, I'll let Shiri answer that one. Then there is Rihama who asks, thanks, who says, thanks for the presentation and the answers you responded to. I would like to know the tools you used for this great result to happen. I don't know if you can actually talk about one tool, Shridi, because I think there is a whole plethora of things that you spoke about. Then there is Bincy Wilson who says, how do you see financial exploitation of working and educated women in current day and age? Are we empowering our girls only to be exploited in more forms than previously? I think I, I will leave you with these five mm -hmm. questions, quite a lot. Uh, let me start with the caste system one. Um, 
so uh, you know this question reminds me of uh, let me tell a, a, a little story on uh, one of the parables in fact so uh, soon after we started Maila Samakya, the Rural Women's Empowerment Program, uh, it was uh, bilaterally funded by uh, the, the government of Netherlands and government of India. And uh, so I was the feminist, uh, the Dutch feminists organized uh, for me to go to um, Holland and, and make a presentation because they had advocated and you know, mobilized, uh, lobbied a lot to get this program funded by the Dutch uh, uh, International Development uh, uh, System. And so they wanted me to come and talk about some of the things that had happened. Now, at this point, we had only been working for two years, okay? The project had been launched just two years earlier. But I went and I was you know, very proud of what we had done in two years that we had built the collectives in 300 villages, the collectives were strong, they were regularly meeting, they were taking up all sorts of issues, et cetera. I made this whole presentation. And the minister for international development at that time was a guy called Jan Pronk. And he listened sitting like this, you know, very sort of skeptically he listened to me. And at the end of it, he said, that's it. That's all you've done? Women are going to meetings after two years? This is the only change you can tell me? I was furious, but I also had to be careful and diplomatic. I didn't want to say something that would make things more difficult for my Dutch sisters to continue funding for this program. So I took a minute to respond. And you know what I said? Well, Mr. Pronk, patriarchy is at least 10,000 years old. I think we deserve more than two years to dismantle it. And his face just went this small. So I would say I feel the same way about did this work contribute to changing the caste system? It's very difficult to answer that in an absolute sense. Do you see what I mean? But I can tell you that if women were now raising their eyes to look the landlord, who is of course an upper caste, in the caste system, okay? Let me tell you another story of how a radical challenge and shift in the caste system. There was a group of villages in a district of Northern Karnataka called Bida district, very, very feudal. It's really stuck in a time warp 300 years ago or something. Now they had a system where the Dalit landless people who were dependent on the upper caste landed people for their daily wage employment in the agricultural fields, at the end of the day's work, they were not given their wages. They were all daily wage workers. They were not given their wages in the field. They had to come to the back of the landlord's house. The landlord's wife would be sitting in the back veranda and they had to file past her in a line and ritually beg, beg for food and their wages. So they had to bend their heads and say, Amore, 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 please give me something to eat. Please give me something to eat. And she would throw stale bread made the previous day and kept in a stack, especially for this purpose, she would throw that to them. And then only after they completed the ritual begging, would the landlord's agent stand at the gate and give them their wages. Wages, the men got a few rupees and two bottles of liquor. The women got no cash they got maybe a small bag of grain or some oil, 
uh, or, or some uh, pulses like this, they receive no cash wages. But no payment whatsoever would be given to you if you refuse to do the begging. This is one of the first issues that the women's collectives took up. They said, we are going to organize a boycott, a strike. We will not work in their fields until the system of ritual begging stopped. Within six weeks, they brought the whole system down. The landlords had to concede and agree that they would be paid their wages at the field. They would not come to the landlord's house for any kind of ritual begging or payment. They got the same payment. They didn't get a rupee more. The women still didn't get money in their hands, but they ended the system of ritual begging. Did we change the caste system as a whole? No. But we built in women the power to begin challenging it. That's the only claim I can make. And I can tell you that those challenges are still going on to this day. So I think what we did was sow the seeds of a process of challenging that hopefully will long term dismantle that system along with a whole bunch of other things that of course have to happen. Children's movements and organizations. Very interesting question. Yes, I know a number of children's movements. In fact, in uh, the work in Bombay with the pavement dwellers, we also founded uh, a, a, a children's organization, a, an organization of street children called Sadak Chap. Again, they named it themselves. Sadak Chap means street brand. And the street brand, and I say it with pride, not uh, with stigma, yeah? And um, I also know of some very powerful children's movements and organizations here in uh, my state of Karnataka, which was uh, a, a movement of children in a whole set of villages from which child labor was being uh, regularly trafficked and recruited for the cities to work in the cities, restaurants and hotels and so on. And one of the things that that children's movement did, which was very powerful, but also very much learning from and taking from the feminist collectives and women's collectives and women's activism is forming their own groups, their own uh, uh, collectives, and also forming their own councils. So they formed what they call the Baal Panchayat, the Children's Council, and managed in a short period of four or five years to insist that the village council or the town council had to consult them and involve them in all uh, decision making, but especially on decisions that would impact uh, children. So decisions on health, education, uh, the use of open areas, land use, etc. Uh, I don't think, therefore, it's useful to say is there a lot of difference between feminist activism and child-led activism. But I think it's more useful to say how can both feminist activism and child-led activism kind of work more closely together because that's what we saw happening in Bombay and it was very powerful when the women's movement and the street children's movements came together and they pursued certain shared agendas with the city council uh, and with the state government uh, policy uh, around the treatment of street kids, harassment by the police, etc., which was a very shared experience between the women and the uh, and the street kids. Yeah, so I think I guess what I think is different is maybe that what I've seen in child-led activism is that they're so much freer in terms of how they are willing to. Uh, the kind of strategies they're willing to use, you know. Um, 
I have seen the street kids, for instance, doing these naked protests, saying, you know, you're stripping us naked. We've already lost our families. We've had to run to the city to escape family brutality, violence, poverty, etc. And here we come and we face your brutality. You know, so they are ready to use those kind of techniques because they're not yet constrained by these norms of how should good women behave and how should we, you know, protest. So I think that could be one of the, of the differences, but, you know, um, I think it's a good question to explore and understand more about. I don't think I, I can really answer more than at this very superficial level because it's a really interesting thing you're raising. I'd like to know more myself about feminist activism and child-led activism. I'm thinking about it right now off the top of my head for the first time. Uh, financial exploitation uh, of working and educated women today. As long as patriarchy is alive and well, you know, the thing about patriarchy is it, uh, it, it, it's a shape shifter, you know? It's like this, it's like this invisible, malignant cancer can adapt itself to all kinds of new arrangements. It can reproduce itself. It can reproduce its primary rules in all kinds of interesting ways. So when we're seeing girls who are educated and working and earning their own living being exploited in new ways, it's because patriarchy, hello, hasn't gone away. What it's also showing us, and this is something I've been writing about for the last 20 years, especially in regard to microcredit, is that guess what? You don't dismantle patriarchy by educating girls or by enabling women to work. Hello because that's not the only place where patriarchy resides. So this idea that, you know, you give a woman a loan and let her start earning and then her entire status in the family changes. Excuse me, it's not that simple. Uh, so if we have these kind of magic bullet, silver bullet strategies, you know, send the girl to school, it'll change her life. No, then you're going to force her to get married then you're going to marry her in some traditional way or she's going to get married. So this actually answers, I think, Mohammed's question. Yeah, uh, why is, you know, so many feminists are getting divorced in Africa, you know? And I, I, I think the way you put it in the question was kind of interesting is that, uh, is there some messaging that's leading to divorce? Is that how you put it? Yes. You know what the messaging is? It is to men that whatever she is, where it comes to you and your rights as a husband, sorry, it's the old way. That's the messaging that's creating the problem. So women are changing. Women are trying to adopt new ways of being, uh, new roles for themselves, claiming new spaces, and men are not changing. So of course it's leading to divorce. Because it's like, when you get married to me, hello, then I want feminism light. I'm the driver, you can sit on the left-hand seat. I'm not saying you have to sit at the back or walk 10 feet behind me, but still, you're still subordinate. That's the messaging that's creating the problem. We're not changing men's mindsets. And I don't think that's the job of feminists. I think that's the job of everybody. Changing men's mindsets changing male expectations, and also giving men uh, new possibilities of how to be in the world. I think that also uh, is a job that has to be done. I don't know who has to do it, uh, but it has to be done, yeah? So I think the financial exploitation is one manifestation, and this male expectations women's refusal to submit to those expectations leading to divorce, and then let's blame feminists for the increasing divorce rate, right? Let's not blame patriarchy. Let's not blame 
the internalized patriarchal mindsets of men, let's blame feminists. Feminists are man haters, family breakers, anti child, you know, lesbian, whatever, you know, these demons. And I know in Africa, those stereotypes are alive and well. Sadly, much more so even than in South Asia. Because somehow, you know, I think the women's movement in South Asia and the long hundred years of struggle against uh, patriarchy here, it's had some impact, some loosening. It is still there. I'm not saying it's not. But so I think this is the root cause of both finding all sorts of new forms of oppression that uh, women face, even as they merge into new roles. Um, there was a lovely film recently about this young Air Force pilot, a young woman, Air Force pilot, and what she faced, uh, the kind of hostility and the kind of, you know, mental abuse, physical <laughs> abuse that she faced because she dared to enter this, this male space uh, being an Air Force pilot. Anyway, um, tools are used for this great result to happen. I think they're there, they're sort of embedded as Sarika said in the presentation. One is strong introspection, always first looking at myself. That's one very important tool. Um, we had this teacher in school who used to say, you know, those typical things that they tell you in school that she, she said, you know, when you point a finger at others, remember that there are three fingers pointing at you, you know. So <laughs> I think that's one tool I used is sort of first looking at myself, what's happening within me? What is it that I'm doing? Um, trying to be more in touch with myself rather than just reacting to what other people around me expected of me or wanted of me. Uh, so that was, I think, one important tool of introspection. And uh, the second is, I think, always trying to create an alternate support system for myself, not just the family, not depending just on uh, the family system to give me, but to actually have a support system of other feminists or intergenerational, you know, from women who were 30, 40 years my senior to younger feminists and always trying to use them as my uh, safe space, but also as a critical space. A third tool that I used that I strongly advocate for all of you to try out is when I became conscious, which is actually the first time I did it was when I went into first time the formal leadership role, which was as head of that women's empowerment organization. That was the first time when it wasn't shared leadership. Yeah, I appointed internal and external watchdogs. So I asked two colleagues in my Lasamakya to watch me and once a month give me feedback on my conduct, on my leadership behavior, on my use and misuse of power. Initially, it was very difficult because of course it was very hard for them to speak to me as their formal you know, superior or boss and tell me frank truths about myself. But we worked hard together to try and make it happen. Uh, and I asked each of the senior leadership team in the organization to set up the same system for themselves. So gradually, you know, we tried to create a culture inside the organization of giving each other feedback, acting as mirrors to each other being critical of that. And I also appointed two uh, women I trusted to give me frank feedback outside. And I would share them, which I now call feminist mentoring, 
which we formalized and did in this project I ran the last few years. Ask them, I would share, okay, this last uh, month, this, this, this has happened, you know, this um, girl was gang raped, this activist was gang raped, these women, their hearts were burnt because the upper caste are upset about these Dalit women forming this group and this has happened and that has happened. And this is how I, be, I, this is how I have conducted myself, how I've tried to uh, organize the response to this and how did I try to share and they would give me feedback. That was very useful. I think that was a third thing. So I think those are some of the key tools um, that I've used. I can't think of any others, but yeah. Have I dealt with all the questions, Sarika? I think so. Yes, and very well. I think it's also questioning the whole notion of tools, you know? Yeah. What is it that we actually call tools? And the other thing that, you know, I, I keep going back to is questioning every institution that reinforces patriarchy. Yeah. Unless if you deal with that, even an educational system, which teaches us what, what a father should be doing and what the mother should be doing ideally. So I remember being very embarrassed as a girl because my mother couldn't spend a lot of time with me. And she was a doctor. And she just, just, mm. just couldn't spend the time that, you know, everyone else's mother had and was not very homely. Mm. So yes, and, and I think these are very deeper structures. Again, you know, picking up from how you write and describe about these deeper structures and the intersections of uh, capitalism, of racism, and of mm. able bodyism and heteronormativity with, with, with patriarchy itself. Uh, very, very inter embedded structures of subjugation that I think we need to recognize. So it's, it's not a very simple analysis which can really be made in terms of you know, two dimensional tools, but has a lot of internal process of reflection. I want to pick up on the last four questions, Shridi, if you're okay with it. Uh, and I, I, I would say that a lot of that has already been answered. So maybe you could keep the responses very crisp. So the first question is, we as young feminists in contemporary world, there is challenges we encounter such as patriarchal laws and traditional beliefs which devalue women's rights. So what can we do as young feminists to overcome those challenges, especially in African continent? I think when you were responding- Sorry, what are the challenges? What can we do as feminists? And this is basically about traditional norms and practices. And the question is vis-a-vis -vis Africa. And I think you took a lot of that when you, you were responding to a question in the last session, right? The second one is, do you think the term gender has become a catchy word to gain attention from the donor to get funds rather than believing in equality? It's a very interesting one. Leaders and people in positions still practicing patriarchy, where they provide minimum respect to women. I would like to know your personal experiences. Third one. <laughs> yeah. Third one is I'm interested to know how to develop theory which are not academic. And how can a person develop that kind of theory? I, I, I think the second and the third one really need a response. Most people think that women come together and the feminists use this barga as bargaining, as gaining power. Can you clear my doubts? So most women, most people think that women come together under feminism, use this as gaining power. Can you clear my doubt? Hmm. So these are the last four questions. But why why is that a problem? Why is women seeking to gain power a problem? I haven't understood. Is there something wrong? I mean, it's phrased as though there's something wrong with this. I think it's it's the... women coming under coming together under feminism as a way of gaining power. You're saying, oh, I see. You're saying not because they are committed to feminism yes, and the yes. feminist change, but because it gives them a new space. And... Yes, yes. yes. 
links yeah. with the second question as well and power yes. in a negative sense yes sure sure that's happening but that's not unique it's like how many do you remember i don't know if many of you remember this or no 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 you won't remember it if you're under a certain age um, but there was once a, a whole lot of jokes about uh, ngos and one was called a bringo a briefcase ngo that is it only exists in the briefcase of that guy who claims i'm working with this community i'm working with that community and you know convinces donors to support him and there's nothing on the ground so this is not something new and it's not something unique to women i'm not defending it i'm not saying it's right but i'm saying i'm asking the person who raised the question to interrogate your own question a little bit and ask yourself if you're saying that if somehow unconsciously you're feeling that women shouldn't do this women should be better than this no oh, this is the world people are going to try to get power in whatever space and way they can and there are always going to be people like that that's not something determined by gender in the old days women did it by gaining influence over the powerful men in the family as a mother in law or as the queen or as the mistress of the man or what people have always used whatever spaces they can get to get power if they feel that's where the power is so ask yourself why are we seeing this as particularly wrong when women do it using feminism versus say men do it using social justice activism and briefcase ngos or 2000 other ways scams saying you know give me your bank account details i want to transfer 2 million dollars to you etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah so i mean i can't answer that question because i'm not clear yes feminism will also be exploited by people who want a quick route to power and who don't believe in it exactly just like there are tons of people out there in the ngo world in the social justice world in the human rights world who are not really interested in advancing that agenda but they have some personal interest which they are pursuing yeah uh gender is a catch phrase for donor money same answer yes uh and i'm sorry to say that it's a catch phrase that donors have played a big role in making available you know and it not not interrogating very closely what do you mean for instance if you say i'm a gender activist when i sat in ford foundation if someone came to me and said i'm a gender activist i would have just torn them into little pieces and sent them saying go back start again figure out who you are and then come back because you know if you're trying to support and reinforce gender then i'm sorry i'm really not here to support that agenda yeah so yes i think there is a lot of motivation there's a lot of but but let's again let's think bigger let's think larger let's look at all the ways in which money influences social activism let's think of all the ways in which money influences feminist activism so suddenly the flavor of the month in india was child marriage child and early marriage everybody and his sister and her sister and her cousin and her niece were working on early and child marriage and all the other issues you've been working on for donkey's years no money is here or people had to say okay we'll work on early and child marriage but please also support our work with you know dalit women or with uh young girls in sports or whatever <laughs> whatever they were trying to do you know they had to do that so there's lots of ways in which money 
pushes social change agendas, that that's what we should be challenging and interrogating, not just these symptoms of it or little pieces of it, I think. And organizations like AVID have tried to do that. You know, they have very seriously taken on the donor community and challenged them around how are you funding women's rights work? And are you doing it the right way? And is there a better way? How do we develop theory that's not academic? Uh, I'll tell you how I learned to do it and take from that what you will. Every week when we started organizing the women pavement dwellers, most of them were illiterate. They were from Eastern UP and, and Bihar, the most backward regions of our country. Um, and I would, I was reading a lot at that time, Paulo Freire, Marx, etc. Every week, I would set myself a challenge that I have to take one concept, and I have to explain it to them. And if they don't get it, I have failed. It's not the theory that's failed, I have failed. And then I gradually became better and better at explaining this in simple language and in relating the concept to their reality. So extraction of surplus value or social democracy, Rosa Luxemburg's, you know, taking those concepts to the community and saying, Acha, this week, we'll, let us try and understand there's this one interesting idea I just want to try and explain it and you see if you think it makes sense. Not like now you listen, I'm going to teach you this idea. So that was the process through which I learned to do it. And then I think when I started really seriously um, training young activists who came from a diversity of backgrounds, um, diversity of educational backgrounds, some even, you know, sometimes not very familiar or comfortable in English. I had to do the training in many Indian languages. I had to do the training in East Africa when Kriya was running the institutes for East Africa. And we had a lot of translation into Swahili. That was the second process that really helped me demystify. Because when, because so, that, so that's another tool, if you like, that I found very useful is how can I explain this term in a non-English or non-Latin language? If I can explain empowerment in Swahili, or if I can explain uh, patriarchy in Canada. So I had this whole module I had done on called the rise of patriarchy, how patriarchy arose it's history, that's a very new social system. It has not always existed. Most societies were matrilineal before patriarchy, et cetera. The women were so excited, they converted it into a street play in Canada called Awa. Awa means woman. And uh, they performed it. They'd go village to village and perform this and say, you think you were always like this? No, women were not always in the subordinate position. There was a time when we were equal, you know, and so I think there's ways in which you can translate academic concepts. If you take yourself out of the academic context and push yourself to explain it to non-academic audiences, that's the only way. Have I missed one? No, I think no, that's No, it. you yeah. haven't, you haven't. Oh my gosh, what an amazing session it has been, Shrizi. I think, you know, I, what I really want to go back and, and just to pick up from this academy question that you were talking about, you know, if, if we uh, think that we can begin with our bodies and us being sites of change, and if our analysis can start from the most precarious person, hmm. you know, then I think we have just started it. And sometimes it's okay to ask the right questions rather than just answering them. It's not just always about answering this question. Hmm. So uh, 
uh, on behalf of all of us here, I, I want to thank you and what a pleasure and what an honor it has been to host you, Sridi, here. And, and you know, I, 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 it would not be a hyperbole to say that the pearls of wisdom, when they came organically, you know, with an inherent critique of feminism, not defensive. You know, I, I think that's what feminism at the end of the day is all about. And that's what I'll take with me, I mean, for my lifetime. And I know a lot of us will take a lot of that. So thank you so much, Shridi, for coming over. Eileen, would you like to add something? No, I, I just am so deeply appreciative. And every time I hear from you, Srilatha, every time I read something um, that you've produced, it just, uh, it just, I learned something new and uh, I'm just delighted that we had an opportunity to get two hours of your time today. So thank you so, so much. Everything you've talked about is what we really are, are trying to, to embody in the work that we do here at the Cody Institute in the Center for Women's Leadership. So I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. And Srika, thank you so much also for really um, coordinating this lovely discussion. I'm so excited. Thank you. So it's my turn to thank you and share with you perhaps one last method I developed for myself. I am so honored. I, am, I feel so fortunate uh, to be um, able to you know, speak about this journey and these insights with people who are also on the journey you know, and if my insights support any of you in your journeys, well, then that's a privilege. But let me tell you what I do when people like Sarika and Eileen, whom I respect and admire so much, say we feel so honored and, you know, you are so great and it was so great and all. You know what I do? I have developed this practice. I have a guru. And she is a woman, Guru. And she is one of the people who has helped me a lot on this inner work. So what I have learned to do is to take all this praise and place it at her feet. That this is some greater power. I'm just a small vessel. And that's my way of making sure it doesn't go to my head. So I receive with great love and appreciation and humility, your thanks and your appreciation. And I offer it to her and thank her for letting me be a vessel and a vehicle. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Sridi. I think Medina would have been very proud. I'm, I'm sure wherever she is, she is very, very proud of you. And it's like this say, it's not about the journey, it's about the companion. And I think yes. that, that you will be for us, with us forever. I, I look forward to, to it. I just want to take one moment to tell everyone that we've got Sridi's friend, Shireen from Africa, another scholar, another activist, another thinker, all feminist on 28th around the same time. So please don't go away, come back again, and we'll be in this journey together. Thank you, Sridi, sending you lots of love and lots of love and strength to everybody who came here. Namaste and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Khudafis. Bye-bye.